Have you ever had an old, outdated leather chair or couch that you would like to refinish? Would you like to be inspired by a fellow refinisher who has continually pushed herself into new areas of creativity, developing multiple businesses? Are you refinishing as a hobby and wondering when should you make your hobby an official business? And if you're like me, do you wonder what fall is like in Iowa? <laughs> Those questions and more will be highlighted in today's podcast. So stay tuned for another informative episode of Zebras Before and After. I'm your host, Lane Ball. Today's Zebra Spotlight segment is with Susan of Little Lou Design. Susan was selected for the Zebra Drama back in August. She had transformed two chairs using chalk paint. And what a transformation it was. It was truly dramatic, which is why we it's received the Zebra Drama. Hi, Susan. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Lane. Thank you for having me. Now, obviously, seeing the before of these chairs, I have to say that I think if I were passing them in a consignment shop or along the side of the road, I would keep walking and or keep <laughs> driving, thinking there's no hope for them. I know. <laughs> De describe the before to our listeners and then the after. We hope, listeners, that you can go on and check these out while we're talking. But if you're driving or working, you want to know what these things look like. So Susan, describe them uh, for us, the before and the after. Yeah. So the before they were, they were pretty ugly. Um, they had some, it wasn't even, I don't know, some deep brown tone of wood. And then the leather was almost like a greenish gold leather. It was real leather, but I don't know. It was just not a pretty color. So when I came up with the inspiration for the chair, I actually had seen um, a beautiful leather chair for sale, for sale online at a high end furniture store. And it had the similar shape. And once I saw that, I, ser I, was, I started my search looking on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist for um, chairs that resembled it as far mm -hmm. as the fabric and the leather and then came across these chairs. And thank goodness I was able to see beyond <laughs> the <laughs> colors <laughs> and uh, transform them. So the end result was a um, kind of white more of a weathered gray wood stain uh -huh. and then the um fabric or leather on the chairs was white with the blue stripe down the center yeah big difference <laughs> yeah i mean very 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 uh dramatic change you know this is so interesting because i thought well maybe you bought them or had them and then you looked at them and came up with the idea so that's cool that you had an idea in your head and then you went out searching for something that you could use to transform them into to the idea in your head. So that's that's really neat. Yeah, that's how I've been working a little bit lately. I find um, a really you know pretty piece of furniture that's you know a few thousand dollars that I would never buy, and see if I can find something similar in shape and style and, and transform it. Yeah, that's well, that's that's very good to know because I think sometimes people struggle with you know just buying a piece outright and then knowing what to do with it. And so yes. to be able to, to be inspired beforehand, um, I guess the challenge at that point is just trying to find a piece that's closest enough to what you want. That probably takes a little bit of time. Yeah, this was, I don't know, I got lucky with this one and I probably was searching just for two days and then found those chairs. So I was so surprised. They were almost identical to the original one that or very similar in style mm -hmm. um, to the original one that I saw. So I was it was that was luck that time and the, the couple it was a younger girl and her dad that were selling them super nice because they were selling in an area that i typically would not want to drive to uh -huh. by myself but they were very sweet and, and met me in a area that i was a lot more familiar with so yeah. um and they were happy to see them getting uh you know a new life and a, a renovation yeah exactly well you know it's funny how styles change and you, you were talking about the color of the chairs and and that's why i was joking about if i saw them i'd probably pass by because i would think you know what what could you do with them you either have to have a decor that would those chairs would work well in <laughs> And, and a lot of people don't anymore because styles change. But but I could see them, you know, back in their day, you know, being uh, a really nice um, set of chairs and, and a, maybe an office or something like that. But you really just did a phenomenal job. Why don't you tell us um, what the process was like, you know, even from did you have to remove the tax and pull? I mean, did you keep everything in place and you worked with what, you know, what you had there? Did you have to deconstruct anything? Um, a little bit of both. So I, I 
I deconstruct, I was able to take the cushion out very easily, which made my life a lot easier just for painting and sanding and everything. So the back cushion stayed on, but the seat part, the seat cushion was removed. I just was able to flip it over and, and unscrew it. So that made for, so I had to sand the whole chair down because I was going from a darker stain to a lighter stain. And so that, you know, that took some time, but it, it, it I just spaced it out over many weeks period of time and tackled it here and there. But so yes, I disassembled it and then did a lot of sanding. Um, to remove all the stain from the wood and then um, use the weathered gray stain Mm -hmm. and then started working on the cushions. So I actually used um, a clay-based tuck style paint, the Country Chic Pico. That's such a pretty navy blue that I used um, for the stripe. So I first painted it all white with um, a white chalk paint and then taped it off with painter's tape to make my blue stripe down the middle of the cushion in the middle of the back and multiple multiple coats and actually the first coat whenever you're painting fabric or leather has to be the first few coats actually watered down just so it kind of absorbs so it doesn't just chip off so it had many many coats and sanding a little bit in between and then the last coat i just waxed over it i used the annie sloan white wax um for the wood and for the white paint and then i just used a clear wax for the blue because i didn't want to dull it down at all um, so it was it was a long process, but I was happy with the end result. I did not remove the um, nail heads that lined the um, chair because I've done that before, and I still am far from perfecting <laughs> application of nail heads and keeping them in a straight line no matter how hard I tried. So I just kept them, sanded them, and then um, put a – kind of painted them silver so it would go better with the whole color scheme of the chair. They were like a browny, yellowy brass color to begin with yeah when you like when you speak of you know watering down the chalk paint to paint Mm -hmm. on top of the leather Mm -hmm. did you you just cleaned the leather i mean was there any kind of treatment that you did to the leather before you started painting your first coat of chalk paint i did not so i just i cleaned it and that was pretty much it i did a chair prior to this so this is my second um well second and third because it was a pair um chairs that i painted the one before that was a fabric one and that actually was easier because the fabric absorbs the paint (laughs) much more quickly (laughs) so that one I, i was more confident with this one is still i guess it was a little bit of a test kind of up in the air to see how well the leather took the paint but i watched lots of tutorials on youtube and so i wasn't the first one to do it and people have had luck so i said i might as well go for it but it it is easier to paint fabric because it will absorb the paint a lot easier than leather so i just you know was patient with it and did a lot of coats because it does absorb and because i went from a that browny yellowy green leather to a white (laughs) one you had to have many coats you know, just any rough estimation of drying time? Do you just, is it just get dried at the touch before you put another coat on or did you get well, it 24 well, hours? I would wait um, at least a day in between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you did have to be patient. It's probably, oh, yes. it's probably hard when you know this is coming together and you're like, oh, man, I just want to get this thing done. <laughs> you know, I was nervous too. So each step that I moved forward, I wasn't too eager to get into because I was curious, all right, is this going to work? I had my picture in my mind and I was afraid it wasn't going to turn out like that. Yeah. So I was definitely taking my time with it. Other pieces I love to just start and finish and get through. But this one I was nervous with so i was not in a hurry to finish it <laughs> um so it, it, it i probably probably worked on it for a good month i think both of them until they were completely done and then it was exciting because as soon as i posted i did get so much interest which was nice oh man yeah incredible and uh it was one of the most popular zebra transformations as well that uh that we post and you know a couple just quick questions with respect to this i'm sure others may have these same questions but when you are painting leather and you put several coats on it, how does it wear? Apparently, based on what I've read, and you know, we they didn't, I haven't had them around for that long, but yeah. it will, um, the leather will wear like regular leather. So it may um, kind of crease and yeah. wear, but it should not chip off. Yeah. As long as you've done lots of thin coats and sanded in between and finished. Um, the product with, well, for me, I was using wax and that's, I think, I don't know if you can use any other product, but I was using, um, paint wax. Mm -hmm. So 
I guess, you know, time will tell, <laughs> but for <laughs> now it's doing well. I did take them. Um, so a woman bought them and I did take them back because I, we learned now along the seam of the bottom cushion, I had to kind of open up the seam a little bit more to get paint down inside because oh, it was starting to show a little bit there. But, but I, you know, I learned from my mistakes. And now if I do another one moving forward, I will make some changes and make sure, you know, you sit on it a lot, test it out. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's that's really good. But you know, when you were talking about wearing, you know, the way leather wears, that's 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 to me ideal, you know, because yes. you, you want a chair to wear and the way it's supposed to wear. And that's mm-hmm. what I was wondering too, you know, because leather does I mean, that's the neat thing about leather. The longer you have it, the more it wears and the softer it gets, most types of leather. And so that sounds great for this as well. And then one other question too, you mentioned using the chalk paint wax, or you said you used which was it Annie Sloan wax? So I did, yes. I used Annie Sloan white wax um, for most of it, but then I had, an, I think I probably had either um, the Chippy Barnes clear wax or Annie Sloan clear wax that I did over the blue stripe. So yes, I waxed the whole chair. Now this may be a crazy question. Maybe most people are like, eh, what are you talking about? How come you don't know this? <laughs> but the question <laughs> is, once you wax it, do you have to let it sit for a long period of time before you can sit in it? Because I'm thinking, you know, you sit down and then you've got wax on your rear end. Or your <laughs> It, you know, it should cure. So I think it's about 24 to 48 hours for the wax to cure. And then you can buff it. Um, and it, I mean, you don't apply it heavy, so you should never sit down and have it come off on your clothes. Right. But yeah, the wax will kind of not harden, but it will cure. So then it won't come off on clothing or anything. But about 24 to 48 hours, I forget exactly what which one um, it ha- it is for the Annie Sloan wax. I guess you can touch it and feel it and know whether it's cured yeah. or not. And I yeah, guess, it definitely shouldn't be sticky or tacky at all. And I and I suppose it's probably not uh, a, a bad thing to maybe wax it periodically, maybe down the road. Correct. Yeah, I think just as you would normal furniture, just to keep it up um, right. and maintain and preserve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I I understand, I think you commented that you used a zebra paintbrush on this. Of course, I always use my zebra <laughs> paintbrushes. <laughs> Well, that's very good to hear. We love that. You know, I would imagine that uh, when you create two pieces like this, now, because you said you you sold them, but I was thinking when you, when you posted those that you used, you got them for yourself. I bet that's really hard to get rid of something that turns out as beautiful as these did. And they're my favorite colors too. I love blue and white. Anything. Um, my, if I had done them for myself, I would have done a dark wood um, stain on the chairs because I love that combo, but I had to stop and say, okay, wait a minute. Think about <laughs> the majority of people in this world right now, the lighter staining colors are in. So I actually didn't do what I would prefer. And I ended up doing the weathered gray look because I figured that would be, you know, appeal to more audiences. Yeah. So that helped me not want to really keep it at my house because it's a little <laughs> out of my style. But when I staged it in the, um, that was in the Kind of rear of my foyer, my daughter walked by, the same daughter that helped me stage the last furniture. She said, Mom, these look fantastic here. Why don't you just keep them? And they did look really <laughs> nice there. Yeah, well, that's that's the most ideal situation you and your creative piece that you really would like to keep it for yourself. So that's that's excellent. Well, Susan, phenomenal work. You did not only you didn't only do just the hard work, but you made all the right decisions to make them beautiful. I mean, the like you just mentioned, the the stain color and then the color of the the leather with the blue stripe down the middle really turned out nice. Thank you. And you know, there was a funny thing that happened um, the other day. I went for my yearly physical or annual physical with my doctor, and we just talked about vaccines. I mean, um, tetanus shots, so on and so forth. They said, "Oh, you're good for a tetanus shot for another ten months." I said, oh, that's good because I am often dealing with rusty nails and screws. Yeah. And he started laughing and he said, wait, uh, are you serious? And I said, I am. He said, what do you do? <laughs> so I explained to him. At that point, I was working on those two antique desks too. So there was a ton of rust and rusty nails. And he thought I was joking. And he said, really? And I said, he said you know what? Let's get you that tetanus shot now. <laughs> so it was funny. I kind of blew his mind when I said, oh, almost daily. I'm working with rust and rusty nails. And he had to laugh at that one. And I did too. But same thing with this chair, just removing all of the old nails and yeah it was funny that's what you know it's interesting because there are a lot of hazards to you know there's hazards i guess to a certain degree to any job even even an office job you're sitting and it's hard on your back um but when you think about furniture refinishing and you know we talked about this on last week's podcast about you know your workspace and all of you talked about stacking furniture and i'm just thinking in my mind how hard on your back is that (laughs) 
I'm a physical therapist too. That's my, I have my doctorate in physical therapy. Oh, so wow. I think that helps me <laughs> All right, lift the right way, move the right way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know what, Susan, we maybe we'll have you back on just for a special podcast talking about the right way to stack your furniture and the mo- <laughs> to maneuver. Because seriously, you can, and you know this, you can really hurt your back. Um, yeah, and it's a big part of the job. It really is. You know, and a lot of us are women, I think, in this profession or hobby or whatever. So you do you need to keep yourself safe. I think a couple, um, maybe even a year ago, you had another I don't know if it was a spotlight or you had a, a painter, a furniture painter on, and she was a physical therapist too, which I think was no longer practicing. I thought, oh, that's funny. So maybe you can get her along too. Yes, <laughs> I yes. We'll have to... now, <laughs> no, that's really good. Yeah, because we've had stories of, uh, you know, people talking about, in fact, I don't want to, you know, misstate this, but I think it was the Vintage Sisters on on one particular podcast where, you know, one of them, they were backing up and the piece fell back on them and they were laying on their back with the piece on them and they didn't get, I mean, there was, I don't think anything severe happened, but you know, they were just, they were actually laughing about just the, it's such an interesting job and so many different aspects of it to it. Yeah. I've had a few pieces fall on me, but I've been standing and it hasn't knocked me over, but yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll definitely pursue that podcast. That would be a great topic. Well, Susan, we're going to keep an eye on you for more of your dramatic transformations. Thanks for coming on to share the details. Thank you so much. As most of you know, each month we highlight a furniture refinishing artist on our blog and interview them on our podcast. This month of October, we're featuring Lindsay Bowman of Rustic Owl Furnishings. You can listen to Lindsay's interview on episode 34 of our podcast and check out her work on thezebrablog.com. In the meantime, we wanted to continue the celebration of Lindsay's accomplishments by having you hear from a few of her social media friends. This will be fun as this is a surprise for Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay, this is Patty over at Midlife Revival. I just wanted to congratulate you on being selected as October's Feature Furniture Refinisher. When I first started following you, first on Facebook and then later on Instagram, you had me at Buffalo Check and being a fellow Michigander. But since then, you have kept my attention with your beautiful, versatile style and staging. Thank you, Lindsay, for all the inspiration. Again, congratulations. It was well-deserved, and I hope that someday soon, Hopefully, before the snow starts to fly, we can meet in person to talk all things furniture. Hi, Lindsay. It's your favorite Aussie here. It's Ashley from Blue Red Interiors. A huge congratulations on being October's featured artist. You've been such a huge inspiration to me the past few years that I've known you, and I've loved watching your brand grow. I love every single piece that you do, and I know straight away that a piece is yours when I see it in my feed. I love the heart and soul that clearly goes into each of your pieces and your unique styling. You clearly love what you do, and it shows through your work and your photos. Thank you for being such an amazing person and inspiration in our furniture painting world. Hello, my name is Megan from Lovely Jubbly Furniture. I would like to congratulate Lindsay for the October feature on Zebra Painting. I love seeing Lindsay's work. Each piece she creates is so beautiful and different. Her page is truly an enjoyment to see. Thank you to Patty, Ashley, and Meg. We know Lindsay has lots of friends, but we wanted to have a few share their appreciation for her and her work. We are privileged each month to feature our monthly contest, The Zebra Review. We always take every opportunity to thank our judges and our prize sponsors. Well, this month, one of our judges is also a prize sponsor. That would be Katie Cloud. Most of you know Katie as one of the trailblazers in the furniture refinishing industry, setting style trends, inspiring many other refinishers. We aren't surprised in the least that Katie would also start another great business, manufacturing a full line of candle products as well as perfumes. We are eager to spend some time chatting with Katie, learning more about her businesses and what we can expect to see from her in the coming year. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm good, Lane. How are you? I'm good. Okay, let's compare weather, Katie. So what kind of fall are you guys having so far in Iowa? 
It's actually been pretty nice. Um, it's so unpredictable in Iowa. Uh, this morning we actually had snow. It was our first snow here. We're on like the no western way. western side of Iowa, so I know maybe the eastern side got some snow a little yesterday, but this morning we we had some snow, and it was pretty snow, and it's gone already. So it's still a little bit above freezing, but it just was a perfect day to have a little snow with uh, what I had going on for work. So. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's fall, but there's definitely snow in fall here in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that is that normal for this time of year? Do you get snow? Um, actually, I just looked back on my I was looking back on my memories on Instagram, and it was a two year ago memory. First snow was um, October fourteenth, and then I think last uh-huh. year it was like Halloween. So, yeah, it's not uh, normal. I mean, I wish it would wait till like mid to end of November, that would be perfect. But yeah, usually yeah. the end of October, it's not strange to have a little bit of snow. Well, it's a beautiful fall day here in North Carolina. We are topping off at 71 degrees. And for our friends on the Celsius scale, I believe that is 22 degrees Celsius, but it is beautiful out. And, you know, we, we head to the mountains periodically because we're about about 45 minutes to uh, Blowing Rock, Boone Area, which is where the Blue Ridge Parkway is. And um, it was pretty last week. But I think this week and part of next week is probably going to be what they call, you know, obviously the peak season. So we'll hopefully be able to make it back up for a trip before the leaves start falling. Mm-hmm. Katie, you started off as a furniture finisher, and I guess it's okay to say you kind of hit the pause button for a period of time on refinishing. So my question is, are you still on pause? And if so, how long? I mean, when will we get to see more Katie Cloud furniture pieces? I am definitely on a on a hard pause. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't intend to, I guess. Um, things really just kind of took a turn during um, COVID and kind of the shutdown. Yeah. So I I've not quit. I've just kind of been quiet about what I've been doing, kind of behind this behind the scenes. I'm definitely still buying things um, in preparation for my new store that will hopefully be ready summer or at the latest next fall. It is way bigger than the one I had, so I'm I'm really searching for um, big pieces and a lot of statement permanent pieces for the store. So I'm always buying, um, and with my husband having an auction business, I'm I'm I get to go to the auctions. I already know what's going to be there, so that's kind of a little perk. And I've I've gotten some good things lately at some of his auctions, so I'm definitely buying still, just kind of hoarding it in a little corner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that's a big perk. That is, it's pretty, it's pretty nice that you uh, get the heads up on those auctions. Yes, definitely. Any idea on how many pieces you have refinished over the years? I actually just got asked this probably last month, and I don't even know. Like I've never counted. I've never really kept track. Like when I first started, I would have a little journal log of each piece and like what paint I used and you know yeah. what I did and blah blah blah. And then I just kind of quit doing that um, because I felt like my Instagram was kind of my diary for that because I would write, you know, what I used on every piece and what color, what top coat. And then that kept me when I needed to look back, I'm like, oh, I'll just go look and see what I did to that piece. And because they want that color. And that was my, my journal basically was my Instagram post. And um, I, I don't know. I don't even know. I would say at least probably 700 started Uh when I was 20, one, 21, 22. Uh-huh. Um, so it's been several years. Um, I would say in that area, I'll have to try to figure that number out a little closer sometime. Yeah. Well, that, that is a huge number and that's amazing. That's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Has it been hard stepping away uh, or has it been yes. just you feel like it's been a good break? <laughs> uh, in the beginning, I was like, you know, this is nice. It's nice to have a little break because I was, I was overwhelmed for a while. Um, I just got into so much custom work and I know a lot of furniture, furniture finishers can relate because I've had many discussions with mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of other furniture finishers about this. And custom work is really hard. It's, you, you are self-employed, you know, you do what you want to do, but ultimately you have more bosses than you ever did working for someone else. You know what I mean? Like you have a lot of people and I know people, they get so excited because they want you, they they want a piece of furniture. They want you to redo it. It's just, it's a whole different 
atmosphere mm-hmm. when you're working on something for someone and working on something for yourself. Sometimes when you take a break like that, it just recharges your creative juices and your creative processes. And yeah. so is it, I mean, like, are you itching to get back into it? I am now, like in the beginning, like I said, I was, I was ready for a break. Um, now I'm, I'm so inspired by all of these amazing furniture artists. There are so many out there right now. Yeah. Everyone is so good. And I'm just sitting here like, gosh, I just want to paint again. I tell my husband every day, I'm like, I just want to go paint. <laughs> so I, I did pick up a paintbrush last week, last Friday, and uh, painted a huge cabinet that I'm going to be taking to a market in November. So I, I am definitely itching to paint. So you mentioned this earlier, you closed down your shop, but you are moving to a bigger space. And fortunately, we get to sort of track what's going on through your Instagram stories and see the progress. But uh, the new space is just, is it across the street or close to where the other uh, shop was? Um, So my first little shop was in Moville, which is like 10 miles north of where we live. Um, And my new shop is 10 miles east of where we live, which is my hometown of Anthon. So the towns are like 20 miles apart, 15 miles apart. So not far apart, different, different towns, um, which is funny because I'm still on the northeast corner of the Main Street Square where I'm at now. And that's where I used (laughs) to be in the other town. So we sold that store during COVID. There was a lot happening, a lot going on. It was just not being used. I couldn't be in there. Um, My candle business was growing and I needed space to make them. And that store just wasn't functional in that way to work for me. And it just, everything just happened at once. It was so fast and it was like, we got an offer on it. So we're like, gosh, we just sell it. And we sold it. My husband actually did the auction for, um, the grocery store in our hometown. Both of our hometown is Anthon and, uh, sold the, the stuff that was inside because they, it just had sat empty and they knew, you know, it wasn't going to be a grocery store again. So, um, some family friends in town were like, you guys need to buy this building. It would be so cool if Katie and company would come to town. And at the time I'm like, Oh no, you know, like I just <laughs> got out of this. Like I just need a break. And after we cleared everything out and everything was taken out, we stood there and just looked at it and it was empty. And I was like, gosh, this is so cool. You know, we could, we could do something here and it's cool. It's our hometown. And, and it just, everything just went from there. And we got the building and, and my dad and my husband think I'm absolutely crazy still, but they're, (laughs) they're beginning to like, believe me and trust me a little bit about, you know, doing the old wood floors over again and tearing out the ceiling. And we're going to have the original tin ceiling in there. Um, the original brick wall. So, uh, yeah, well, that's kind of where we're we're at now with that. But yeah, everything just went so fast from one yeah. building to the next building with no intentions of doing either of those things. Yeah, it's interesting how things like that unfold. And um, you see the opportunity to have left one area and to go into a new area that is is, is really perfect for what you're doing. And as you continue to expand, that's, that's exciting to see that. Tell us, tell us about what's happening in the new space and and really what your, the, the end goal is like, what's the plan to, um, as you unfold that and get it, you know, ready. And it sounds like it's going to be quite beautiful too. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot actually happening. Um, two years ago, the city has owned the building for a while, quite some time. And, uh, they applied for a grant actually a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, and they got it. And it was a, the state of Iowa gave a community catalyst grant away and it was a Mm -hmm. large sum of money and it was to be used for renovating an apartment in like an old um, historical building on main street, you know, in a rural Iowa small town. And this is funny. I'm going to step off the question for just a second because I get this question a lot too. (laughs) People are like, Oh, how, how big is your city? I'm like, you wouldn't even believe me. Like for me to put a business in a town, there are, I'm pretty sure the population is like 560 people right now. So this t- is a, not a city. It is a small town. So you can make it anywhere. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we got this, we got, uh, the city had got this grant and it just wasn't working out with the city owning the building with the money, but they had to do certain things that um, if an individual owned it, they didn't have to do. So mm-hmm. they kind of just said, you know what, we're not going to use the money for that. 
the, the grant can go somewhere else or whatever. Well, it had still been there, and when we were considering buying it, um, they were like, you know, you get this grant if you wish to, to take the money, but you only have nine months left to use it because you get two years to use this grant. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy cow, like how do we build an apartment in this completely needs gutted, mm -hmm. you just run down upstairs building. And my dad, who actually did the, all the original estimates for um, remodeling it, the plumbing, the electric, and all the, the stuff, which was a process, um, he, he said, Katie, I can do it. You know, I, can, I, can, I already know the ups and downs, what needs to be done, what I need to do. We can do it. So if you buy it, we'll get it done. So I said, let's do it. And uh, he's been up there working his tail off. He is such a hard worker. And uh, we got just recently, um, we got all the electric put plumbed in, the spray foam insulation done in the apartment. And we're doing sheetrock right now. We've sanded the original floors down. Mm -hmm. um, we're keeping some peaks of some of the original brick. Uh, we couldn't keep all of it. But mm -hmm. we're kind of making it like a lofty style. Um, yeah. We're going to do an Air Airbnb. And oh, wow. there's always people coming in and out of this little town. There's so much happening on this in this little town. It's just so cool. Um, we have a really good steakhouse, and um, the bar has the best wings in all the area. And there's a pizza <laughs> joint, and there's just a lot of little small businesses like starting to come to town. So that's really cool. But ultimately, the bottom, what we've been doing is slowly working on it when we have time. Um, we've kind of peeled up four layers of flooring <laughs> to get down wow. to the original wood. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a brick wall exposed from the plaster and lath. We've gotten the drop ceiling out. So we have the tin ceiling showing, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, while, the, while Dad's working on the upstairs, which is we have a deadline, so we have to do that. We just made the downstairs able for me to to push some candles out. Like, I needed some space. So yeah. I now have surface area for pouring lots of candles, and um, just having that space has helped so much. So right now, we're just kind of like a little, a little candle factory in there, making candles, um, using the room that we can, uh, mm -hmm. slowly working on that when we have time. So I think our goal, my goal is summer, next summer to be finished with everything, fall at the latest. And I wish it could be sooner, but there's just, there's a lot we need to do. And that's kind of the end date goal. And I plan on having um, my furniture in there in a store again, like I had a showroom kind of deal. Um, I love vintage. I'm always picking. So a lot of vintage stuff. I want to incorporate other small businesses and makers and wholesale from them and sell their products. And I don't know what our plan is a hundred percent just cause it's kind of far away. If I, I, I would like to just kind of have a monthly open house and just do like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, once a month, like a grand opening and then, you know, close back down for those few weeks to regroup, to find more stuff, to do more furniture and still mm -hmm. continue to do the candles too, um, mm -hmm. with it all in one spot, it'll be nice too. Cause I was making them at home before and hauling them all the way up to my store and back and forth and back and forth. You know what I mean? So this yeah. has been nice. They're all kind of in one spot. Yeah. And I think, I think it's interesting just over time. And I, I've we've seen this in uh, some of the smaller towns in our area is that people like people from the larger cities like to travel out on the weekend and go to the smaller towns and go to some neat shops and places that, to eat that are unique to those areas. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that will happen. And maybe, as you said, it's probably already happening in your town. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing is just going to bring that in even, even more. So that's, that's really exciting to, to be a part of making that happen. Yeah, we have a good community here. It's a really... I don't know. Like their small town is, it's just so cool to me. I, I never thought in my wildest dreams, graduating high school and moving to a big city, I would be back. You know, I was, yeah. that was never a thought in my mind. And it's there, there isn't anywhere I'd rather be, especially raising children. Like it's just a yeah. really good small town is just a really cool place to be. It's just proud to be from a small town. I like it. Yeah, there's a quaintness and a coziness that people really like and admire. And I think that's why people enjoy visiting the small towns. And 
potentially move, you know, out of the cities back to the, the small uh, areas. Mm -hmm. So so tell us about the candles you have uh, for your winter launch, because I know that's really big right now as you're as you're getting orders ready for that. So just launching the winter collection, which seems crazy, but it's time, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you got I have... snow this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was fitting, uh, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I usually try to keep some fall in there. So I have fall and winter available right now, both probably till the end of November. We'll kind of kick the fall out. But so the winter collection, I try to keep about six because any more than that gets kind of hard just because we're making more and more each year. Um, I, I wish I could make 20 different fragrances, but it, that's just too hard. Um, so I have five returning scents from last year, and two of them I've had for, this will be year five. And then um, I have a new one. So I have a new one that's called Winter Twilight, and it's just really cozy, and it's kind, kind of got like a berry smell, like a black cherry and blackberry, but it's also got that cedar smell to it, so it's kind of woodsy and just a really good, different um, fragrance that you don't really expect, I guess, in the winter. I, do, I don't want to just have holiday-scented candles. Like, I wanted yeah. to have... October to March candles, you know, sure. and after the, after December, it's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to burn a Christmas pine candle, or I don't want to burn something that smells like cinnamon sticks all the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I threw in a few that are still like cozy scents and winter scents, but not, you know, holiday scent, smelling scents, but I definitely have those holiday smelling scents in there and they're also really awesome. So, yeah, I have Yuletide that's returning, um, I think, three years now, December, which is year two. Farmhouse Waffles, I've had that for two years. The Cranberry Marmalade, this is year five. And Tinseltown, this is actually year four. So, yeah, wow. I've had some of them for quite a while. They just, I think people would be heartbroken if I took some of them away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool, too, that you have, uh, you know, candles that go beyond the holidays. I think, you know, yeah. I, I don't know a ton about candles, but I would assume that uh, it's probably just been a, a popular thing to have like the Christmas candle. And then when January comes, it's like, well, the next candles are, are spring candles, but we all have candles that you can, you know, you can enjoy up through, like you said, March is, is mm -hmm. really nice. Yeah. Cause you don't want to burn a, a spring flower candle in January and February, you know, no. yeah, you're not quite ready there. I usually throw, <laughs> right. um, my, I have a Eastwood, uh, rustic woods and, um, a shiplap one. They're just kind of floaters and I throw them back in there, March, April, May up until yeah. fall again. So they'll come back around too. So people have different options then. Well, I've said this before, but you know, your candles really are amazing. I mean, they they aren't too strong, but they aren't, they aren't too weak. And they smell fresh. They smell clean. And when I mean clean, I don't necessarily mean, mean a clean scent, but they just smell healthy. You know, they don't mm -hmm. smell like they have fake stuff in the candles. Yeah. Everything is like paraben and phosphate free cotton wicks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no bad in these candles. They're very clean burning, um, pure soy wax, which is cool because I'm supporting, you know, farmers. And I like yeah. that idea just from us, you know, being um, country people. So Yes, everything is very clean and nothing is harmful in these candles. So, Well, let's talk perfume because I purchased Black Amber for my wife and wow, <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's exactly what I hoped it would be. And fortunately, my wife loves the smell as much as I do. You know, it's funny because, you know, what compelled me to buy it was... I think, it's, I think it has patchouli. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, there's some patchouli in there. Yeah, and I, I knew she really liked that essential oil. So, and, and she also loves that, um, you know, after I, I was asking her the other day, I'm like, you know, uh, what do you like about the black amber? And, well, of course, the, the scent, the, the smell is just, it's just such a unique um, scent to it. But she was saying, you know, these perfumes are clean, um, no bad ingredients, and uses, she uses a lot of essential oils as well. And she mm -hmm. said, you know, it's even kind of neat how, you know, if she's using another essential oil, it just blends well, even with the perfume itself. So that's, mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Cause some on their own, you're like, Ooh, but when you add them with other ones, it can totally transform that, that yeah. fragrance. So yeah, black amber is, it's been awesome. People have, and it's, it's, it was scary because to sell a perfume online, you're like, 
I don't know. Can I, should I just go ahead and buy it? What if I don't like it? You know? So I, I sent out hundreds of little tiny samples when I first started right away. So people could get an idea of, you know, the fragrance and Mm -hmm. it's definitely a unique smell. So I was, like I said, I was nervous, but the feedback has just been incredible. It's just very different than any, I don't know. It's hard to, to describe. I just unique and different and it's, it's feisty. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's date night <laughs> perfume. I call it. It's yeah. just you, everyone yeah. notices it when you wear it and everyone, yep. when I wear it is says, what are you wearing? So that's, I, I, I feel like that one, it's going to just be the ultimate perfume <laughs> always. Yeah. So it'll probably be a mainstay probably for many years. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, funny, a number of years ago, I visited Cairo, and while I was there, I noticed that uh, there were so many scents that were unique, you know, like exotic and just really nice. But when we got the black amber, I told my wife, I'm like, you know, this really reminds me of Cairo. Um, Is it just, you know, I don't know how to describe it either. Um, You know, it was just, it it just reminded me of those um, oils, essential oils and perfumes that they have over there that, because I remember thinking, you know, uh, I had the the privilege at the time. I don't know that they're doing that anymore, but I took a, a camel ride around the pyramids, and oh, cool. one of the things that yeah, it was it was really really uh, it was just amazing, breathtaking. And we stopped off at this little place just not far beyond the pyramids, and they it, it was like a it was like perfume and oils, and so many of them were just it was just it was just very unique. They were smells that I had never smelled before but they were just they they it was just sort of a quality and they they were actually quite expensive Mm -hmm. but they just i don't know just it's like you said it's such a difficult thing because you know when you're looking on the computer and you're looking online you're looking on social media it's all visual yeah how do you how do you describe and explain a scent that is just really different unique and doesn't disappoint you know i mean it uh is, is pretty neat yeah, yeah, it is. It's very different. So, and I've luck- luckily have some really good friends, you know, that have helped me along the way describing that and using it. And oh, I just that's been super helpful too. It, it, and like you said, that like I'm picturing you talking about being in Cairo, and I can see this like. I don't know if this is weird, but I picture like Aladdin and like going through the markets and seeing all the <laughs> incenses and the oils and <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah, essential oils, you know, they're, they're so different. Like my candle oils and my perfume oils are two totally different things. Um, actually my natural perfume oils and my candle oils, they are the same. Um, but my actual perfume like my alcohol-based perfumes, I use different essential oils for those as I do for mm-hmm. the candles. So, and they are, they are not, um, they're not cheap. Like I've had a lot of people say, can you use black amber and candles someday? I'm like, oh gosh, I would be, I would be broke. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yes, there's just, there's something about them and like how you describe that. I'm like, yep, I can, I can picture what that, I can picture that scene. Yeah. It was, uh, and that's, that's what, it's funny too, how certain scents can take you back, whether to your childhood or to somebody, someplace that you travel to. And that's, that's what it was for me when I smelled that. It took me straight yeah. back. And to that's Cairo. what they're supposed to do. Yep. Bring back yeah. memories and this nostalgia of the candle, you know, it's supposed to do that. Is it harder coming up with uh, perfumes than candle scents? Yes. 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 It's so hard. Um, I had the thought I had it all figured out, you know, in the beginning when I was going to do it and I did a 180 and started all over. And I think like three months later, I figured out what I was actually doing because I wanted them to be good. You know, I didn't want to just mm-hmm. throw it out there and try it. Like I wanted them to people to wear them for a while around here and try it, make sure they were good. So it is different. It is harder. Um, and that's why like, a lot of people are like, when's your next one? I'm like, I'm only doing four. Like I can only do four right now, <laughs> one a season. So, um, and I've been releasing um, each perfume. I have two. I actually am working on the third one. It's actually perfected. Um, they come out in my seasonal box. So the people that get those get, you know, the preview of the uh-huh. next seasonal perfume. So yeah, oh. my, my goal is four this year. So I'll have four, four total in a calendar year. Yeah, well, no, you're just going to have to make sure you, you come up with some good colognes as well for men. 
Yeah, I've had some people ask that. So <laughs> I, I haven't done much um, with that yet. I need to find some time because I, I would like to do that. Yeah. Well, tell us about a few of the other products you have. Uh, I think I've seen you have, car, you've got car diffusers as well, correct? Yeah, yep. They're little um, uh, oil car diffusers and they're refillable. Um, so that's pretty cool. You know, they're eco-friendly, reusable. Um, you don't have to throw them away. I have reed diffusers, which I just started a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. Um, and those are great, especially for people that don't want to have an open flame in their house. Mm -hmm. um, they're really good for bathrooms, entryways, because that's where you, you know, walk into someone's house and get that first initial smell because we burn candles for people to smell them. And I mean, I burn them too, because I just enjoy the, the atmosphere with them. But the reed diffusers are just great for right, right when you walk into your house. And uh, what else do I have? Linen and room sprays. Those are good, mm -hmm. too, for anywhere, any room. I have people that say they leave them in their car and use them in their car, too. So, Does the reed diffuser, is it more localized then? It doesn't spread as far um, as Yeah, I would say, like, it's good for... Um, like a bathroom, you know, sized room, or entryway sized room. Like if you would put it in a big open dining, living room, kitchen area, you're not going to smell it on one side of the room, mm -hmm. you know, from the other side. It's just going to kind of be like in that area that you're in. So like I have one in our living room that's sitting on the, on the um, end table there with the lamp. And every time mm -hmm. you're sitting on the couch in the chair, you can smell it really good. Or when you walk through the room and the air kind of pushes it, you can really smell it. Um, but it's... It's a little different than a candle, yeah. I would definitely say that. Well, we really appreciate your monthly role as a judge on the Zebra Review and that you are offering up great prizes as one of the sponsors, Katie. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to do it. I love I love the furniture community. I love, you know, giving these candles to people, especially people that haven't got to have them yet. And, you know, I just, I, it's cool. And I'm just, like I said earlier, I'm just so wowed with the, the amazing talent out there right now with the furniture industry. It's insane. Well, we're going to take a short break. And then when we come back, Katie's going to answer a question from a refinisher in our Ask a Refinisher segment. This podcast is sponsored by Zebra, makers of the high-end yet affordable line of application-specific paintbrushes. Zebra's new website is up at enjoyzebra.com, and we invite you to take it for a test drive. Test drive, because it's more than an ordinary product website, there is plenty of inspiration for you, as well as a really cool quiz that guides you to the ideal Zebra paintbrush you need for your painting application. You can peruse the products that range from our paintbrushes, of course, to our latest apron designs, to our new paintbrush kit offerings. That, I might add, come in a really unique canvas bag, and any purchase over $35 or more means free shipping for those living in the United States. Our Ask a Refinisher question today comes from Melinda with Yellow Creek Interiors. Melinda had several great questions. Her question we are sharing today is for Katie with Katie & Company Furniture Restorations. Here is Melinda. Hi, Lane. This is Melinda from Yellow Creek Interiors, and my question is for Katie Cloud. Katie, we've watched you grow your business from refinishing furniture to selling your own brand of home goods and perfumes online. When is the right time to formalize your hobby into a business by applying for a business license and getting insurance? And at the same time, should you also create an LLC? What's the first step in starting that process? And is it expensive? All of these questions can be really overwhelming. And so it's helpful to hear from others who have gone through it and created successful businesses of their own. Thanks for sharing these tips with us, Katie. And we can't wait to see your new store when all the renovations are complete. Hi, Melinda. Thanks so much for the questions. Um, it de definitely can be overwhelming. Um, and it's really good to ask questions, um, just like you're doing now. Like I have asked a lot of other entrepreneurs, small businesses um, questions, and I still do today. I think for me, and I know it's probably going to be different for everybody, um, when I decided to turn my hobby into a business, you know, I was doing a lot of things for family and friends, um, and then it was to the point where, you know, I was I was buying a lot of products, and I was buying, you know, um, I had bought a sprayer, and I thought, you know, I could use this and write this off for taxes, and, you know, I could become a business, and I could 
um, you know, really put myself out there and really advertise then. And so that was kind of when I decided, to, you know, to change my hobby into um, a business. And I didn't start out right away as an LLC. You know, sole proprietor is where I was. I had another job that I was still working. Um, and then this was kind of my side gig. So I just became a sole proprietor and I had some liability insurance, which wasn't, um, wasn't ex horribly expensive at all. And I asked around a lot too other insurance companies, and I'm lucky to have someone in my family um, that is in the insurance uh, business. So it was helpful to be able to ask questions like that. So if you have people in your family that are in like, accounting or in the insurance business or friends with other small businesses or business owners, it's good to ask them to. Going about getting the, the license, I know it's different for every state, but um, mine was I applied online for it through um, the Iowa uh, gov government website, and it was a it was a small fee, you know, just to to take a big step. So it was definitely worth it for me. Regarding expense, um, when you're starting a business, I think you I, you gotta have your budget ready. You gotta know what you can afford. You gotta know what you can spend, and you don't want to do everything at once. You know, don't you have it planned out, you know, write your write a year's worth of your goals and what your plans are. And then, you know, start with what you can afford, you know, get your insurance, um, your LLC or sole proprietor, what you decide. Make sure you can afford those things um, along with, you know, being able to buy a couple supplies, you know, to get started if you need them. And just add to that because the the more you work, the harder you push. The more money you can make, the sooner you can, you know, grow or add more to your business. So I think the expenses part, um, you you can do it to where it could be really expensive if you did start everything at once and it would be harder. Or just start where you know you're comfortable and you can do it, add to that. I hope that makes sense because um, that's what I did. You know, I, I, had, I had nothing when I started and I, I saved everything to start, you know, and work my way up and set goals. That way you can tell yourself, I'm going to make this much money so that I can afford this. And your expenses can change through throughout the time as you go. Melinda, you asked some great questions, and I'm sure there are many of you out there that were eager to hear Katie's response. Katie, if you would, provide your contact information for those that would like to reach out to you or who would like to shop your candles online. You can always find me at Katie Cloud on my Instagram, and my website is katiecofurniture.com. Um, I have a Facebook page also, Katie, Katie and Co. Furniture Restorations. So um, any of those places, you can reach me if you have any questions. And I hope I answered your questions, uh, Melinda. And if I can help you in any other way, just reach out to me. And I'm, I'm happy to chat with you about any of them. Thanks, Katie, for taking the time to join us today. Your knowledge and insight is always spot on. Have a good day. You too. Thanks for having me, Lane. We are so grateful for each of you, not only for listening to this podcast, of course, but also for using our paintbrushes. We love it when you tag us in your stories and posts showing what applications you're using zebra brushes on. And that is not just furniture refinishing, but also painting your homes. We will always make it our priority to highlight your furniture refinishing works of art on our zebra painting Instagram account and Facebook page. But we also want to make sure we highlight notable home projects as well. If you have used your zebra paintbrush on a home project and you want us to check it out, make sure you tag your pieces with zebra inspo. That's hashtag zebra inspo, Z-I-B-R-A-I-N-S-P-O. The Zebra Review Monthly Contest is underway for October and the theme is, well, you guessed it, October Glory in appreciation of this season's beautiful fall colors. Entries are open until October 31st, 2020. Just step outside and appreciate all the colors of reds, oranges, yellows, and greens that are so popular in nature this time of year. Use the hashtag the Zebra Review, and you'll have your piece before our judging panel as they will choose three winners. This month's guest judge is Joe with Click to Restore. She was our first place winner for August. Great prizes await the winners from Shakto Interiors Milk Paint, D Lawless Hardware, Surf Prep Sanding, Katie Cloud Candle Products, and Zebra Paintbrushes. 
All pieces refinished from January 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2020 are eligible for entry. Zebra Collective Quarterly Contest for Fall is open for entries as well. There are so many ways to create your furniture pieces by reflecting the inspiration of fall with vibrant colors to dark crisp colors of fall leaves, cheery and whimsical themes to the natural tones of the season. Make sure you tag your pieces with the hashtag Zebra Collective. We are so grateful to our prize sponsors who range from Weather Wash, Surf Prep Sanding, The Chippy Barn, Redesign with Prima, and our Zebra Paint Brushes. All pieces that were refinished from June 1st, 2020 through October 24th, 2020 may be entered. We would love for many more people to discover the Zebra Before and After podcast. Please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast directory. It really does make a huge difference in the rankings. And thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Zebra Blogs Before and After Furniture Refinishing Podcast. Today's episode is also featured on the zebrablog.com along with contact information for today's guest. Your comments and suggestions for future episodes are always welcome, and we encourage you to share those by clicking on the podcast slide in our header at the Zebra. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and happy refinishing. Blog.com.